It's the AR take back. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. When them pills try to get at you, drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Don't leave them on the countertop. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. Drop them in the box. No cure for disease of addiction, but our best bet is to start with prevention. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the recovery clinic. If you have not already went and hit that like button, do it and share the video now. Uh, man, we got a super special guest for you. I love this dude. It's just me today riding solo. Uh, check this out, though. Christopher Dickey is actually in an RV traveling around the nation with his family. Uh, how cool is it that that dude accidentally got on a bus drunk? and came to Arkansas to be a real estate salesman uh, on a slip up. And now he's traveling the nation in an RV with his family. That is insane. The possibilities of recovery is completely endless, man. So I'm really glad you guys are here. Hey, Amanda, too. Uh, Teresa Roberts, uh, Edith Justice. I'm glad you're here. Stephanie Schultz. Hey, Teresa Roberts, uh, top fan, Sherry Oyster, everybody. Thanks, guys, uh, for tuning in. I'm really glad that you guys are on here with us. Uh, so uh, it's a public show. Be cautious of what you um, type in the comments if you don't want it to be out there in Internet land for the rest of your life. Uh, be mindful because that's where it ends up. Um, we got a really cool guest. He's a real good friend of mine. Uh, he's in long-term recovery. And so this guy literally uses his past and his recovery story to save people's lives. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and bring him on. Uh, some of you guys probably know him pretty good. He'll be popping up right here. Hey! What's up, Jimmy? Kyle Brewer, what's up, my man? How you doing, brother? Man, I'm blessed. How are you? I'm good, man. Thank you for uh, having me on the show, inviting me to come have a conversation with you. Uh, you know, I'm just grateful to be here. Well, you know what? I am super glad you're here. Uh, you've got an amazing story. Uh, you've got a, an amazing job. And you're actually, you know, man, you're kind of leading the way in what you do in that setting. You know what I mean? So that's really cool. Uh, so tell me what's going on with Kyle's world. Didn't you just have a birthday or something? I did, man. I did. I did have a birthday uh, last Friday. Celebrated three years in uh, long-term recovery. What? Uh, I got yeah. it right here. There it is. There it is. <laughs> yes, let sir. See, let me see if I can make it bigger. I can't make it bigger. That's, uh, bam. Thanks. I can do it like that. By the That's grace of God, man, I'm, I'm, I'm here today. Uh, celebrated that three years. Three years ago it looked a lot different than it does today. Um, so I saw that picture. You look you look like a co-star on The Walking Dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I was not healthy. That's to say the least. I was not healthy. I think I was about like one forty. Yeah. Oh, one forty in that in that picture. It was my intake picture at the, the Nehemiah House homeless shelter. Uh, my uncle dropped me off there, and uh, I was telling him kind of what was going on in my head before we got there. So, and I was tripping. He was like, look, he's like, just go in there. Don't say anything to nobody and go to sleep. Well, so, wait, back up, Kyle. Let's talk about what was going on in your head, man. All right. Tell, tell us some of some of that psychosis stuff you had going. I mean, we can laugh about it today. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We can laugh about it. But, man, it was so real then. Um, so what had happened was I'd been on opiates and heroin for a while, uh, for a long time. And I was trying to detox myself off of opiates, you know, trying to find my own way uh, by using meth. And, you know, so that led me, I'd been in a hotel room for several days, uh, in isolation, um, using. Um, and then by, so by this point, I thought the police were after me for, I thought I'd done committed a double homicide. Um, I thought that I had AIDS. Just, man, I, my world was driven off of fear. And I thought these people were after to get me. Um, and so I'm calling my family, you know, and, and my family, they're devastated because this is certainly not the first time this has happened. But my uncle, my uncle's important part of this story. He's in recovery himself. And uh, he saw this as an opportunity, you know, and he came and picked me up because uh, I was just in a state where I was willing to just get picked up. And and then so he dropped me off at the Nehemiah house there. 
Yeah. So let me get this straight. You're on one. I mean, mm -hmm. you're Willy Wonka and you're whomped out. And you think somebody has done <laughs> somehow or another and in, planted the AIDS virus, the HIV virus in your blood count. Okay. Let me, let me, all right. How, how did the that happen? Thing about psychosis, man. And this is so, it's, it's incredible how this is used today because I can so much relate to someone in that spot because. Oh, me it, too, dude. Every, every time. I, every time. We got some jams. You know, I can be a dad today. My nine-year-old hey. has a telephone and that's his ringtone. You know <laughs> I'm like, hey, did y'all hear that? So yeah. every time I used, I immediately went into a psychosis. Like the second I put a chemical in me thinking it was going to change my situation and the circumstances surrounding me, which is complete insanity, by the way. Uh, um, that is uh, like I went I went cuckoo. You know what I mean? Yeah. I thought. There was like this millionaire person that had unlimited resources. I had wronged this person. And the second I used, despite the fact that I was homeless, didn't have a pot to pee in, didn't have anything anybody wanted, Kyle, I became the target agenda for everybody. Yeah, no, for sure. I, <laughs> I was I the only that. thing on their mind. You know what I mean? So I get yeah. it. But how, how, did, okay, go back to what you were saying. That's well, just how it, was, it was so real. Like I remember it like it was yesterday, the whole narrative that was going on in my head. And um, and so this is by the, by the time I got to me and my house, I'm in the, the homeless shelter part of, of their program. And I'm trying to like just lay in this bed. It's like one o'clock in the morning. And so there's a room full of people. And so that just spun me out more, you know, as far as just people were out to get me. Um, and so what I thought, I thought there was a female, I thought there was a woman there that was coming to save me, you know, that had heard that I was there and she was coming to be the answer and to save me. And so God, the reason God sent you a woman. Yeah. That, that a, lot of, a lot of people in early recovery can relate to that. <laughs> I, it's not just any woman. No, it, it was a, it was actually the daughter of the African king and queen. Okay. And so, yeah, yeah. So they had lots of money, lots of resources, like you said. And um, they ran a background check on me. Her her dad, her mom and dad did because they obviously didn't like me uh, because I was where I was at. And so they ran a background check and that background check came back and I overheard the, the results. And the results was that, you know, he's currently has two active warrants for, you know, homicide. And we found out that he has AIDS. And so that's what. That's how I got the information. Like this is the story your mind created for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, at, at you, you, the most nonviolent uh, drug user ever, right? <laughs> uh, has suddenly just magically collected two homicides and HIV, and yeah. somebody just blew that on you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, everything was you know every decision I made was based off of that. It was based off of you know, fear based off of irrational thinking and it was based off of delusions. But the thing is, in that moment, none of that was irrational to me because it was real life. That was exactly what was happening. There was no telling me any differently. Um, and I remember when the directors of the Nehemiah house got in that next morning because I came in on a Sunday night. I had never met them and I'd been tripping all night and I walked into their office and told them what was going on with fear in my eyes. Uh, BJ Carpenter looked at me and I'll never forget it, man. He said, Love BJ. Yeah, love <laughs> yeah, man. He's my, my guy, him and Jeremy, man. I love them. They're a big part of my life. But he looked at me and said, okay, he said, we're going to call you, uh, uh an ambulance <laughs> and uh, you're going to go to the hospital. <laughs> and so, and just like that, yeah. just like that, he knew, he knew what needed to happen. Um, so yeah, they called an ambulance, man. I went to the, the hospital. Um, unfortunately the, the psychosis didn't stop there. I had to, I was trying to escape. I ended up getting tackled by a security guard and had to get sedated and, you know, all that good stuff because, you know. <laughs> oh, man. I love it when we get to the security guard tackled me part of the story. He's a big old dude, too, man. My, my, the next couple of days, my shoulder that I landed on, because what happened, you know those socks they give you in the hospital, like the real slippery socks? Yeah. When I was running one time, the first corner I got to, I started slipping in those socks and he caught me right then. <laughs> and when he tackled you, did you have on like the hospital shrubs or the gown I with the butt? Gown. Gown. I was just in a gown, nothing else. They'd taken everything else away. The kind um, of gown that doesn't cover your backside? That's it. Yeah, the one that died. Yeah, that's exactly what I was wearing. <laughs> This is crazy. That's good stuff, man. The true insanity of addiction. Like that's what. 
And, and you know, we would know, I don't know about you, Kyle, but I would know that that's that type, you know, because my perception was my reality. Yeah. It didn't have to be real to anyone else. If it was real in my mind, it was real. It was legit. You know, my behaviors were based off of my beliefs. And I believe mm -hmm. that there were people out to get me and they were writing messages and trash uh aluminum foil i would see hidden sentences and the way the foil was created i was i was insane it was insanity and so i knew that would happen the second i used every time i used i knew that was going to be the outcome and i would use anyway i would willingly put myself in that pain that misery and that paranoia you know and so uh, it's, it's, so anyway tell me about life today now that we know where you were at then what's going on now like you're you've got a lot of attention lately i've seen you on the news a couple of times uh i i you know you're you're kind of moving up in your field why don't you talk to the viewers about what it is you do where you work and how that addiction story that you just told has transformed into your recovery story as the strongest tool you've got all right well, yeah, let me man. hear it. let me hear it, all right well you know you said that i'm getting a lot of attention and i you know i'm just thankful to be in this position you know thankful for you you your leadership the state of arkansas you know the different entities that make something like this possible because um though i may be in the role man there's there's so many people that are represented by me sitting right here you know hundreds of people that have that have invested in me to get me to where i'm at including I'm yourself proud. Um, and so, yeah, I'm grateful to be a small part of the incredible work that you and many other people are doing around the state. Um, Big shout out to Jeremy and BJ for that. Yeah. Call. Hey, Best they're the investment yet. <laughs> when they didn't know what they were doing, but peer support, that that's peer support, man. I saw them living a life that didn't consist of using drugs and alcohol. And they had families and they were coming to work and they didn't realize, and I didn't realize, but that gave me hope that that, that was a reality for me. And they let me walk alongside them and be in their life and, you know, guide me and just do life with me while I was in that program. And they're still I mean, just had lunch with them uh, like last week, the week before. They're they're still so important to me. But, you know, peer support, they were the first peer support for me. And it just definitely changed my life. Um, but what I'm doing today, man, as a result of, uh, you know, like I said, the great work that this, people in the state of Arkansas are doing, I, I've got the opportunity to be. I uh, went through the core training for peer support and uh, got certified and got a job at the uh, UAMS in the emergency department. And so essentially what I do is um, I, I'm stationed in the emergency department and say someone, you know, an individual comes in like I did the exact same situation. And they end up in what's called the B area of the emergency department. That's where we're psych people that are acting the way that I was acting. That's where they would end up. Or someone comes in just just overdose and just got brought back with Narcan or they're in withdrawal or they're there for a variety of other reasons. They have underlying substance use, you know, issues going on. And, you know, a doctor or a social worker would say, hey, this might, this person might be interested in talking with you. Um, I'll just go and visit with people. I'll, I'll go and knock on their doors and say, hey, you know, what's up? My name's Kyle. I'm a peer support specialist. Uh, and do you mind if I talk with you? And they'll say yes or no, like it's a volunteer thing. And then I'll, I'll always ask, you know what a peer support specialist is? And uh, half the time, a lot of times, like, no, nah. I'm like, look, that's just a fancy way of saying that I'm in recovery for drugs and alcohol. And, you know, I understand what it's like to be, you know, kind of going through what you're going through right now. And we'll just start a conversation. And so that, that's that's your foot in the door right there, because like. I, I, I'm sure that there are a lot of peer supporters uh, in the live stream. You know, I see. Uh, Joel, uh, I see Sean Pruitt, I see uh, Tata, JD. you know, JD, JD I see, uh, you know, Bonnie Stribling, I see uh, Ricky Tatum, you know, Joseph Cruz, Teresa Apple, you know, I see a lot of peers in here. And so that's a question I get a lot. Like, how do we introduce ourselves as peers? So that's, that's your selling port point is you just ask them what it is. And when they say no, you just tell them that's a fancy way of saying I'm in long term recovery from drugs and alcohol. Yeah, because I mean, between like if I'm talking to, you know, if I'm getting a job or if I'm talking to you, like peer support means a lot more than that, because it's a legitimate path with with credentialing and, you know, supervision and ethics and boundaries. But yeah. there's no that's none of that's needed when I'm talking to someone like in the emergency department like we're. Like I'm just I'm just a person in recovery. That's it. That's all that really means, you know. 
Um, but I just want to say that because at the same time that like I don't also don't want to dismiss that like peer support is more than that. You know, it's definitely more than just you're in recovery. You know, it it's a it's a legitimate path and a legitimate um, you know role that that can fit in any type of setting. But when it comes to talking to someone I meet in the hospital and we're just getting to know each other, it's just like I'm I'm just a guy in recovery, you know, and I understand what it's like to be where you're at. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes someone's interested in talking. Most of the time they're in, they'll talk. You know, people will have a conversation. Not everybody, like including myself, for for a long time is not ready to like make it, you know, try to make a step towards recovery or whatever. But if nothing else, man, I get to give my card with my number on it. And so I've I've had people reach out weeks, months later after I've met them that they don't have to come back to the hospital, but they have a point of contact in the recovery community that they if they get to that place, they, they have a way out, you know, they can call somebody. Yeah. That's good it's, stuff, it, Kyle. It's man. The, the story I told you earlier, how I ended up over at the hospital and was acting a fool in the emergency department in psychosis. Um, you know, so that is, is so, um, it's so ironic. And, and so just like God to put me in that same setting where I'm interacting with people going through that exact same thing, because, I mean, I've had conversations with someone where I'll describe my psychosis and they'll be like, yeah, like, yeah, that's exactly what it's like. And they're like, you get that. But like, and the only reason I can talk or say that is because I lived through that and I understand that and because it, it was happening to me. And so it doesn't change the, the reality for someone. It doesn't take them out of psychosis, but it gives them comfort in having somebody there that that they know understands them. Um, you know, that that's 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 just a listening ear um, that doesn't have an agenda for them. That's my big thing, too, is I don't have an agenda for anybody I talk to. I want everybody to get into recovery. But if that's not where you're at right now, that's cool. Like, I, I'm just here to just be a hope you know, and plan. A yeah, scene. Exactly. yeah. So one more time, man, I've got to do this because your transformation like the transition that occurred in you from active drug use to long-term recovery is phenomenal. Like, and so I'm going to pull these up again, man. So just so that everybody can kind of see here what we've got, <laughs> this picture of Kyle in the blue shirt, of course, is him in active addiction when he was, that's the day they called the ambulance on you, right? That's the day. Yeah. Yeah. That's July 10th, man. That's the day I, uh, yeah, that's the day they called the ambulance. That's the day I was on one, man. And and what you don't see in that picture, man, which you could probably, man, I hadn't bathed or showered. The bag I was carrying around with my clothes and stuff in it, you know, just Stop. and I had my little my little kit of stuff. It's just I can I can look at that picture and I can remember everything that was surrounding the, that picture. All the sickness, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I look at you over here and I notice you've got second Corinthians five seventeen written down there. And, and so it's no wonder you've given your heart to God the way you have, because he saved your butt, man. Yeah, like, man, that's no doubt. That, like that's we, could put a little, we could put a little makeup on that picture and you could co-star in the walking dead, bro. Yeah, dude, I look like a zombie. That's for sure. My mom, <laughs> my mom, man, my, my family. So such a big part of my life. I want to say this though, family, when it comes to family, my family yeah. has been part of my life and has been a big part of my story. But for many years, they weren't a part of my life. And that wasn't because that's what they wanted. They, uh, My mom went to Al-Anon. Uh, my family learned about enabling and they learned how to let go without giving up. And so, like, I wasn't allowed to be on the property. I, I, they wouldn't take phone calls. There was no money. There was none of this, you know, meeting up and getting me this or that. Like, they had to learn how to do that. And I'll tell you what, man, and that happened many years before I got help. But right. and I called I called my mom and my family every name in the book that I hated them. I threatened them. You know, when they made those decisions, those really hard decisions for them, I didn't understand at the time. But I'll tell you this today. If they wouldn't have done that, I would be dead today. That was a yeah. part of me getting to where I needed to be. Like if, if, if they wouldn't have made those tough decisions for me, um, I never would have got to a place where I'd have reached out and got help. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, James Sweezy said that same thing when he came to Arkansas, when he spoke at the Region 6 first ever peer recovery conference for peer specialists. Right. You know, uh, he said that he found recovery through Al-Anon. And people were looking at him like, what? And they're like, yeah, my mom suddenly went to Al-Anon and stopped buying me pizzas and started paying my life. <laughs> and all of a sudden I was homeless, broke, desperate, nowhere to go. And so I had no choice 
but to sober up or get covered up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I love that. I, I love that because, you know, when you talk, enabling is such a key factor of a lot of people staying in addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's what you're talking about, right? That's what your mom and your parents had been doing. And then they cut you off. And yeah, so a yeah. lot of parents, they live with the fear. Well, what if I do this and they overdose and die? Well, if you don't do that, I guarantee you they're going to overdose. And the chances of death with an overdose increase significantly. Yeah. And I was just I was with my dad Monday, man. Got to go fishing with him Monday morning and just enjoy some time together. Um, and I was talking to him about this, that like like the information that got through to me that I was hearing from BJ and Jeremy, where I at, where I ended up. There's my mom in the comments. Uh, she where where the information that I was hearing from them, it wasn't like new, like profound information. My family had been saying the same thing for many years. Right. So the thing with family members is because of the relationships and the prior inner experience with each other, sometimes for me, they weren't the right messenger, right? It was the right message, but it was coming from a wrong messenger. So it's oftentimes what I find is that the parents, the family are not the people to deliver the recovery. You know, they're not the people to deliver the, you know, the, the fact that you're in denial. We're not trying to hear that from our family. We've been hearing that, but it was, it was someone else that in that's recovery. In yeah, yeah it, was, it was someone that had lived experience and they were saying the same things to me and it got through to me, you know, yeah, same, um, same thing. So, like, I, I get it. We can change an entire nation through conversation. But before the conversation will even be accepted by us, we've got to find common relation with the person carrying the message. Right. No like, no hey, hands down. In one simple word, what I just heard you say was credibility. Mm -hmm. There were a whole lot of preachers, teachers, mental health, everybody tried to reach me. I was in and out of incarceration, juveniles, youth homes, all that stuff. Right. Like. Yeah. And so the people who I would have listened to could not get in those facilities because they had a background. And so the, the people who were qualified to carry me a message that I needed to hear, which would have helped the state accomplish what they the only thing the state didn't want me to do was reoffend and recidivate. Had they let the right person in that I would have listened to, their mission would have been accomplished. But they have so many stipulations that we cut our nose off to spite our face. I needed somebody to say, hey, I'm not going to judge you for stealing from your mom because I stole from my dad. Yeah. Yeah. What? Let me talk to you. then. Let me tell you what else I did. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. so within a matter of seconds, I was, you know. That's the that's the value of peer. That's how it works. But some, yeah, that's the value of peers. That's the value of of being able to establish, like you said, some common goals, some common uh, uh, some common backgrounds, and you know, just establishing a relationship. And then, but look today, man, look at you. You know what what you're able to do, and you know, just uh, with your lived experience and working at the dr drug director's office, and lead you're leading the way here. Um, and then my my past experience, like we talked about earlier, my experience in the hospital, like. All that is uniquely used to to speak to people because there'll be something that someone says and it's like being like I've been through that, you know, and like so I'm able to like um, in a way like just relate and identify, identify with the person that like, look, you're I'm here. You're here. We're the same. You know, like, there's nothing different about us. You know what I'm saying? I know what it's like to be where you're at. And I know what it's like to get out of it, you know, and uh, and then I also say this that like, look. I'm not going to dismiss that this sucks, you know, like this is not a good situation because um, I'm not also going to go in there and say, look, hey, this is no big deal because being uh, at that spot is a hard place to be at. And for the fact that someone's in the hospital, um, no matter the circumstances that brought them there, is that they're alive and that they they're having a conversation. Those two things are so important that you are alive and that you are having this conversation yeah. that highlights strength and courage and, and a first step in the direction um, you know, cause in that, in that moment, you know, when you're in the hospital, nobody goes to the emergency department because it's the best day of their life. No matter what the reason you go, you're in a crisis moment, right? Like you're yeah. going through something. And so that's why you end up there. And, or you, and some people uh, get admitted, some people don't, but regardless in those moments are times where people are most open to receive new information or to, to try something new because, yeah. you know, things are falling apart. And uh, so that's why I try. I try to like, you know, to, you know, we'll work together in those moments and kind of keep some momentum rolling down the street to kind of make a plan and get connected. Yeah, I want to read this comment your mom just posted. And I also want to go back to 
first I want to throw up Sherry o o o Oster's comment. You know, she said, uh, exactly. I figured out that I was enabling my son to death. And so, you know, that's sad. Mm -hmm. I get it. Uh, and then your mom came right behind her and she said, you know, for any parent or family member listening to what Kyle said, we uh, we had to do we had to do what we Kyle said we had to do did not happen overnight. It was not easy at all. There is an amount of guilt that you feel, uh, but it is so it is the only way to help them. So please reach out to other families who understand and to keep yourself sane and hold your and hold your bottom line. So what your mom just typed in there, bro, was peer support. That's actually called family support. And that's yeah. when family members uh, have been through similar experiences and they help other family members who are going through those same experiences. So traditionally, when you talk peer support, you've got three categories. You've got family support, youth support, and peer recovery. You know, and so uh, those three distinct categories are what form uh, both substance use peer support and mental health peer support. And so, man, that's that's awesome to see your mom. Yeah, man. Like that. Out to my mom and my dad and my family. Um, I'll when I'm having conversations with someone, like I'll, I'll explain what I just explained, but I, I also will explain, like, look, my mom could can relate more to this than I can, you know, like I was the person that you're talking about, like, but she was the one making those decisions. So I've had the opportunity to get people connected to my mom just to talk, have a conversation. So, you know, definitely thank you, mom, for everything. Uh, one thing she said last last week when that picture got posted, she was saying something about my eyes. Yeah. Uh, she was saying that like my eyes look so much different. Um, and you know, they were just sad, that, bro. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't have any hope, man. I didn't have any purpose, man. I just would. I, I was just in that cycle, and you know, there was nothing. There was nothing to look forward to other than when I when I started having some plan of I was about to get a get some kind of substance, like I would get that spike of energy, you know, to go, go, go. Um, and then I'd use and then it just, you know, start back over. You know, it just it was just over and over again. And then, yeah. you know, and one of the one of the side effects of recovery, man, is that my mom, I think it was the the first year after I've been in recovery at Christmas or something. She had said something to the to the effect of, you know, this has been a peaceful year. It's been a good year. And, and you know, that's really simply said, but that's really profound because what that meant to me was that for however many years prior to that, my mom, and my family didn't have peace because every night there was a chance they would get the call that I was either dead or I was, you know, in jail or locked up or, you know, something terrible had happened. And so for her to say that she had peace meant that she was able to sleep at night, not worrying about me. And, uh, you know, that if there's any gift I can get to my family, man, that's that's the gift right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. You know what I mean? That's a great gift. Uh, I love that. And that's awesome, Kyle. You're you're just all around great man. You know, uh, I, I recently got a report, you know, because my job is I am the state, you know, I'm the state recovery coordinator, which means I'm the lead for the state of Arkansas's recovery efforts, right? Like that's my official job description. That's what I do. Uh, so everything recovery based at a state level falls in my wheelhouse, including, uh, you know, the, the, the program that you work for is actually under me. And so uh, I got the report. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to spotlight what UAMS has done for the state of Arkansas. Uh, I want to say the numbers. Don't quote me on this, guys, if you're watching. It may, I may be off by seven or eight, but not much. But I want to say it was like 489 people that you have encountered and offered services to in the last year in the emergency room. Would you say that's pretty accurate? Yeah, that's pretty, pretty close right there. Yeah, 489 different times. That's 489 lives that you potentially have changed, Kyle. Do you do you understand the magnitude of that? I mean, have you really broke that down? And and I want to say that 66 of those opted into treatment and peer support. Yeah, uh, the, the latest numbers, man, like I said, I, I had to look at it, but it, it's growing. So as the program has developed and kind of figured out this role, Man, I'm, I'm, I've learned like to how to be real effective as far as getting people linked to treatment and recovery. Yeah. Um, and so like it, it's really been incredible to the amount of people that I get to interact with. And 
I just, I have to say this, that, you know, like I said earlier, I, I'm so thankful to have this role, but it, this is a collaborative effort of not only you and everybody at the state level, but within the hospital setting, this has taken uh, the nurses, the doctors, the social workers, the whole staff to uh, be open-minded to this role and, and, and kind of invite me in and integrate me into the system. Um, and so with all those moving parts, man, you know, there, it, it, it could go a lot worse than it has. And, and the fact that it's just been it's been successful because the one thing that all these people have in common is the common goal to help other people find uh, recovery and, and, you know, find health. And, and so we all work from that common goal. Um, so it's been really, really, really incredible, um, you know, just to be here. You know, I'm just thankful to be alive, much less to be. Um, had the opportunity to be a vessel, you know, to, to kind of give hope to other people. Yeah. So, well, you are, you are definitely, as far as the state effort goes, all right, like you were the first official peer to work stationed in the emergency department at the UMA, UAMS hospital. Okay. Uh, you have built out those services. I know you're fixing to go through the supervision uh, the first supervision uh, in the state of Arkansas training to be a actually peer, because in Arkansas, so if you're watching this, if you live in Arkansas, we don't, peer support does not fall under clinical supervision. National best practices are that peers are supervised by seasoned peers. And so we've developed a training under the Arkansas model that ensures peer support workers have a, lad a career ladder to cr climb up to. And Kyle is one of the first 10 uh, to reach that. Now, there's a lot of contributing factors to that decision. One being that we don't have supervisors for hospitals. And hopefully, you know, uh, that would ultimately in a Walgreens world, we would hope that if as as that service grows in that hospital, maybe whoever the decision makers are would, would be smart enough to put you in that leadership position to build out services and have a robust program. And so, uh, you know, I know you've done that, right? Like you've done all well, this I, stuff. Can I say something about that? Yeah, I mean, that's ultimately the goal, man. I want my goal personally is that like to, to make this something where it is uh, the value of it is recognized and needed to where it's sustainable to just be a role within hospital settings. And so anything I can do to contribute to that. But I think something that's very important that I've learned on this journey in the past three years is oftentimes um, something that we want to do, right? Like, like, so say for instance, like I'm like, I want to be a peer support. This is what I want to do. Um, before that actually ever happens, I'm already doing it before it's actually ever a job or a position. I'm already doing it. So I went into the core training, no intentions of it being a job turns into a job, but I didn't know this. That's right. You, I, I, that's right. You were actually a student pastor at first in LR church, right? Yeah, I was in a I was in a ministry program at their church and I was living there and working with the fatherhood program there. I just knew that I, I'd met you and, and you know, recovery. Uh, yeah, I'm you know, I'm passionate about recovery and, and I was super interested in what was going on. And I wanted to be a part of it. But I, that didn't that it, that decision wasn't made with like, OK, I'm doing this so I can do this. You know, it was that like I'm doing this because this will just be more tools to equip me to help other people in recovery. Right. And uh, so I so I just did that really like steps of faith of like doing things without seeing what the what the results going to be. Um, but like I look now and it's like if I wouldn't have done that, all these other doors wouldn't have been open. And the reason I say that is because we're talking about supervision. It doesn't exist right now. And so you could say, why are you going through a supervision training when something doesn't exist? Well, my experience you take those steps in faith. God will open up the doors and make things happen down the road. But we yeah. have, like for me. Um, and people that are looking to get in peer support right now, like, oh, I don't, the job doesn't exist, you know, or I want this job, I want that job. Just start taking those steps, like getting involved in your, in whatever recovery program you're working yourself. Like you can, right. be, you can be doing this already. My job literally started out as a volunteer position. <laughs> like I was volunteering. I was working with the state drug director going around sharing my story at colleges. And then uh, when the doors opened up, I interviewed for it. And I was the only part. There were like 10 different people who interviewed for the job, but I was the only one in recovery. How, how are you going to have a peer recovery coordinator and they're not in recovery? And yeah. so I blew that. You know, I knew everything that there was to know about addiction and recovery because of my personal lived experience in that. I'm the expert in my recovery. Right. And yeah. so 
uh, I blew the hinges off of it. You know what I mean? And so it's, but exactly what you said, I was acting on faith. I felt like God was tugging at my heart that something greater of an opportunity would come. And I still feel that. I feel like there is fixing to be an eruption in Arkansas. You know, I was talking with John Schenhoser from the McShen Foundation yesterday. He called me. He said, whatever you guys are doing in Arkansas, you've got policymakers shook up. He's getting calls from Washington about what we're doing in Arkansas. Wow. You know, that's insane. And and I got to say this too, Kyle, while we're on the topic of, of peer leaders, right? Like I get the credit because it's my job. You know, I act as the recover, the peer support director for Arkansas, even though my job is the peer recovery coordinator. You know, I pretty much coordinate, develop and implement and evaluate all, all recovery services. But APAC has such an important role. And so if you're watching this and you don't know what APAC is, APAC is the Arkansas Peer Advisory Committee, and they make all the decisions. Their role in the state of Arkansas, that's who the state leaders from the governor's office on down has chose to endorse as the lead for peer support. I do not vote on any, you know, I, I, I recently heard that, well, you know, I heard somebody say uh, in, a, in a separate board meeting that, you know, I think Jimmy just picks his friends to go through peer support training. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. There is a system in play, Kyle, right? Yeah. Like you have to apply an application. Then that application is vetted through a committee of 10 people, which I do not sit on. I mean, I'm the lead of it, but I do not vote. I do not have a say at all in any applications. And yeah. so I don't pick and choose anyone who goes through the training. The peer committee does. And so a lot of times people don't meet the criteria and that application gets shot down or they haven't had supervision or uh, they're not registered. You know, it's just something after another. But the peer committee for Arkansas, that's who needs to get the main credit for peer support. I get it. I get a lot of it, like you said, because I'm out there on the front lines. But Bonnie Stribling, Wade Carter, Teresa Apple, uh, you know, Monty Payne, uh, all these people are tremendous leaders. Trevor Valines, Paula Cunningham, like there are so many working mechanisms to it. Les Cup, Sean McCowan, right? Long term people in recovery who are truly Lana Greenlaw at UAMS. Lana well. Greenlaw, yeah, she's a speaker for the upcoming of Recovery Awareness Day, and she's on the list for the next supervision training. You know what I yeah. mean? So we've got all these people who are actually building and investing this. You know, they're silent leaders who don't get the credit. And, and you know, I think we we need to spotlight them because there yeah. wouldn't be peer support. The Matt Burks, the Sharon Mims, the Kirk Lanes, you know, I get it because I'm out here and won't shut up about it. But they're the ones who keep us going. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Jimmies and the Bonnies and the Kyles. We've got a whole army of people who believe in us, who are sick and tired of burying people, who want to take their pain, who ask God to turn that pain into passion. We hit the gas and we never look back. We go back into the fire carrying buckets of water to save lives. And you do that tremendously. You know, no one person can have the credit for peer support. Well, I got on a soapbox in. Um, there you go. Hey, that's, that's, all. But that's how it is, man. That's that passion that I believe you, the way you put it is it can't be bought, taught or replicated. That's it right there. That like, yeah. you can't, what, what, what you got there is, is comes from going through something yourself and you're exactly right. There's so many people. That's why I said earlier, and like when I go to like, I try to emphasize the fact that me sitting here is not a result of myself. You know, number one, my relationship with God. But there are hundreds of people that represent me sitting here. You yes. know, I mean, so many people have planted seeds, invested, spent time, done things, you know, for me to be where I'm at today. And that's exactly right. Like that collaborative team that we have across the state. Um, that's that are working together that doesn't care about who gets the credit. What we care about is trying to help other people find freedom and find recovery that we have. And when you got a when you got a team working with a common mission that don't care about who gets the credit, things that are happening in Arkansas is what will happen and will continue to happen. Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. You can do so much when you don't care who gets that credit. So when yeah. we look at each other as competition, Kyle, we miss the chance for collaboration. And without collaboration, we're never really going to see what God can do in Arkansas, man. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's so many leaders, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, and, you know, while we're on that, I want to give a shout out to Dana Young. You know, I see her in here. She just saved somebody with Narcan recently. 
You know what I mean? So awesome. You know, be a yeah. hero. Keep the Narcan with you. Uh, and that's another that's another part of my job. Uh, yeah, you gave out how many vials did you give out? Man, it's I, the, I don't I don't even know the number, man. It's it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, so another part of the job is that like we'll, uh, we're, uh, through the partnership with the state of Arkansas that we we we'll offer take home Narcan to individuals that come through the hospital, come through the emergency department to, to for free. Well, they don't got to go to a uh, pharmacy or anything. They get it right there and take it home with them. So, you know, like someone comes in for an overdose um, and they're not really trying to go to treatment or anything. I, I give them my information, but they also get to have take home Narcan to take home with them. And I've, we've had a couple of different stories where people have came back into the emergency department and told us that, you know, the Narcan that you gave me last time is actually the Narcan that saved me this time. And so it's, just, you know, awesome, dude. yeah. Yeah, I mean, getting 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 that out there in the community where it's just like something that there's no stigma attached to it, that everybody should just have access to this is, is so important. And so that's an that's an excellent resource that we have to offer there um, in the emergency department. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's amazing uh, because dead people can't recover. Right. Yeah. Like I, I can hear the message. And as long as I as long as I'm living, I've got hope. You know, I feel like. I gotta go ahead. Hey, there you go. You you did the proper corona sneeze into your elbow. That's right. (laughs) So when you sneeze, guys, you have to dab or you'll spread it. You know what I mean? So uh man, that's awesome, dude. I'm so proud of what you guys are doing. You know what I mean? Uh I love what you're doing, Kyle. Uh, you inspire me all the time, dude. Um, you know, thank you, uh Sherry. So apparently I got the wrong Dana. She did not save the person with Narcan. I'll have to go back and fix that later. Uh, You know, I do want to say that peer support training is back up and running. I know uh, who is uh, Sean McCowan and Tawana Greenlaw are in the next supervision training. I think that'll be in like November. But uh, the digital peer training is up. It's going on. It starts uh, August the August, like August 14th. So we'll be doing that monthly from now on. So, uh, and again, just, just if you're interested in uh, being a peer support and doing what Kyle is, you have to have two years of recovery, but send an email to right here. I'm typing it in for you guys to the Arkansas Peer Committee, APAC. Am right there. Uh, I would put attention, Bonnie Stripling. Uh, she is the secretary for APAC, and they will guide you to the portal where you have to fill out an application. That portal then gets uploaded to Mid South uh, University of Arkansas Little Rock, and they host our trainings. And then uh, the peer committee will evaluate your application. Like I said, it's a committee of nine people. Uh, they vote on it, and um, if you get through, then you'll get a phone call from either Les Cup or Sean McCowan. Uh, the last stage of that is a phone interview where they want to talk to you and verify that you're in long term recovery. Uh, and so once that's done, uh, then you get placed on the list and you go through the next available training. Once you've completed the training, you get assigned uh, to a peer support supervisor, uh, which is what Uh, we've been talking about. And so you've got 500 hours, basically, of almost like an apprenticeship that you've got to complete. Uh, But what that does, Kyle, talk to us about supervision. How has ongoing supervision developed your skills as a peer? Oh, well, it's been uh, it's been a a tremendous asset for me personally um, in professional development and personal growth um, and interactions that I'll have that I need just like I'm like I don't I don't know what house was to handle this you know supervision is really like a, a safe place where I can kind of discuss the things that I'm going through at work and figure out how uh, to safely and how to responsibly you know respond and handle certain situations that come up and then other than that it's just the uh, the the every you know the weekly reminder of what peer support is because we're about you know, being uh, in the, you know, like, what is it? We're, 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 we're a part we're of the up. system, but not in the system. Yeah, we're not. Yeah. We're, so we're in these various settings. So like a hospital, a jail, you know, da, 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 da. But like, so trying to remain true to the peer code of ethics and peer, you know, services 
is what it's all about. And so those weekly things, it, it reminds you of like, like, okay, this is what I'm about. You know, this is my loyalty because it can be easy to kind of get caught up in your environment that you're working in um, and forget that. Like, oh, that's, you know, like, yeah, I'm here, but I'm not there, you know? So, um, yeah. and then hearing from it's just, easy, it's easy to get co-opted, you know, into other stuff. Yeah. Without proper supervision. Don't you think? Yeah. 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 It, it, it's supervision for me is, is, is a guiding light, you know, that like I always need guidance, no matter where I'm at in my journey, I will need guidance from someone else that is further ahead of me and, and people that are on the same journey as me. And for so supervision is the group of people that you just listed off earlier. It's a conversation with all those people, you know, or some of those people and new people. And maybe, maybe one week you're not in supervision for you, but you're in supervision to, to provide something that you've gone through. That's going to help someone else that's going through it right now, you know? So it's like this economy of like giving back and receiving, um, it's just like recovery, you know, that like supervision for me is 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 just about like um, as a as a group discussing peer support in the various settings um, and how to stay true to the, you know, peer peer ethics um, and also, you know, learning and encouraging each other and just creating that sense of community. Um, you know, it's been especially important over this time where we're not being able to meet in person, just just finding that just seeing people, you know, just seeing people yeah. and talking to people. Um, it, it's, just, it's just important, man. Supervision is, uh, is, is something that is very valuable because any other um, role that is similar to this social work counseling, they all have supervision, like people meet for supervisor. And, and I think that's because that like, we, like, like I said earlier, we all need someone that's a little bit further ahead of us in the journey that can guide us through it. Um, and so, yeah, it's been incredible. I'm, I'm thankful to, to have the opportunity to be a part of it. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad, too. <laughs> so, you know, uh, sorry, my phone was going off and I was like, why is it going off like that during the show? Uh, obviously, the simple answer is because I had it on. <laughs> Shame go. on me. Uh, mm -hmm. See, how I took that responsibility, <laughs> folks. There was a time Ooh. that I didn't do that. <laughs> That, that was something that we said earlier. We were talking about uh, when we don't care about giving each other credit. And I wanted to say this, that that is a result of individuals actively working a recovery program, because this is something I'm very transparent about today. I still struggle and life is still life on a day to day basis. And there are some days where I think about getting high. There are some days where I want the credit. There are some days where I'm tired of helping people. There's some days where I'm back in my selfish, self-centered self. You know, yeah. like that happens. That happens all the time. But all it's right. because of the gift of recovery and, and and other people in my life that are further along in the journey that I can talk to and that, that people that I trust that I can just, you know, process my, you know, what I'm experiencing with. That's what right. keeps me from acting on all that stuff I just listed off. You know, yeah. so it's like the thing is, is that those things are still there, but it's because of recovery that I'm not acting on them and I'm not living by them and they're not my my driving force in life. Yeah. 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 You can definitely spot people whose life reflects values of recovery and principles than those who don't. And, and you know, that's why we have the phone call uh, part of the application process that Bonnie and Sean and Les do. Right. Like uh, because you can make anything sound good on paper, uh, but can you know, your actions and the way you talk will reflect if you're actually in recovery, you know? Yeah, for sure. I love what you just said, Kyle. That was some heat. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> we're not perfect. <laughs> no, by, by, by no means. And and yeah. some days, man, that those those crazy thoughts happen. Um, and like whatever I'm going through, if it's just a tough day, or if I'm just experiencing some some strong emotions, and the thought comes to me to get high or take a drink, you know, that, those things happen. The difference in something that I've learned is that because I have a thought, it does not have to become an action. But if it's a thought, it, it has to become something, you know, like I got to do something with that thought, but I, I don't have to act on it. I don't have to take that thought and to put it in action. And for me, that was a life changing revelation that when I thought about doing drugs, I didn't have to do drugs because forever. That's how it went. It was automatic, you know. But today I got I got other options. You know, I don't have to go down that road. You know, I take those thoughts and I, and I talk to someone about them. I take those thoughts. I go exercise. I take those thoughts. I go help somebody else. You know, I get out of myself. There's. There's various options and various pathways to, to deal with that. But the reality is, is that the thought comes and it does not have to become an action today. 
Um, yeah. Because I, I just try to, I just try to remember that I, I still struggle some days, you know, like I still, I'm still on this journey. You know, I'm still, I still only got today. I got this moment. I got this hour, this second, you know, I can't get too far ahead of myself. But the, that's also a gift to me, man. That's a huge gift to me because if I didn't have those moments in time where I had those thoughts and those experiences, I would get complacent and comfortable in my recovery and in my faith and in my life. And I would start getting back in my old ways about not needing other people and, you know, get big headed and entitled and all those things. Um, so it keeps me humble. It keeps me at a place of like, dang, like, man, I'm, I don't got this. You know, I, I, I don't got this, man. I still got to keep doing some things to keep getting the same results that I've been getting. And so. You know, at the same time that I say I struggle, it's it's also really a gift. You know, it's a gift to have those things where I don't have to use drugs and alcohol today. Yeah, I love it, dude. Um, I was looking for something to to post on here real quick. I can't find it, Kyle. Uh, let's see. I can't find it, so we'll just bring it up. Uh, what is it? Well, I was going to talk a little bit about Rad. Uh, which is the Recovery Awareness Day coming up August 15th. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got <clears throat> an entire lake, right? Like what we know is that if we don't bring recovery together uh, pretty soon, uh, that we're going to fall apart. And people in, in long-term recovery are struggling because we can't go hang out with each other safely. So we got a freaking lake. We got the whole lake and it's big enough for 10,000 people to safely hang out and stay 20 feet away from each other. We got full bands coming in. We got kayak races. We got to capture the flag event between uh, law enforcement and people in recovery, uh, which we're going to kick their butts. Uh, the flags are really huge, dude. Uh, if, there's any, if there's anything like the kickball tournament. Oh, it's going down. <laughs> it's going down. Hey, you and Ricky Tatum need to put a team together, man. Y'all need to come out there. The flag. Yeah, for capture the flag. Uh, so, you know, uh, and the PACT project, the peer recovery program inside Lono County Jail is graduating that day. They're on yeah. stage. So we've got. That's exciting. Dude, Shout we got, out to Sean and all them, man. That's yeah. going to be good. Stuff. Sean is the valedictorian, man. Sean Winkle oh, is man. actually leading the graduation. Uh, we got, uh, I'm going to be sitting in a dunk tank. So if you're mad at me and you, you want me to talk noise to you, step on up. My wife, uh, uh, who, by the way, guys, is turning, uh, her birthday is tomorrow. She's turning 35. I almost didn't say that. I was scared. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you caught yourself. <laughs> but she, I mean, she looks 28. You know what I mean? How lucky am I, dude, that I've got a wife that still has the physique of a 25 year old. I'm not weird. I'm a husband. What do you mean? There you go. Hey, yeah, you got to uh, honor your wife, man. Yeah, you doing my wife. Oh, God sent me an angel when he sent me Chelsea, bro. The first thing she told me was, you know, it didn't happen like this, but it basically, this is the gist of it. Fix your hat, pull your pants up. You're 38 and look stupid. I fell in love. I didn't know if I wanted to date her or fight her. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's her birthday tomorrow. And so we're, you know, we got us a cabin and a boat and I'm excited. Uh, took off work. You know, get to, you know, I get to do that because of recovery, you know? And so, um, that's a, man, the, the event, man, that, that's something else that just, I didn't know existed, bro. I did not know that there was a life. There was a group of people out here that had fun, that had community, that enjoyed life without using drugs and alcohol, you know, like I didn't know that that was a possibility. So like it's so important to, to offer these opportunities where people can come together and just, you know, have fun, just have some good, clean fun. And, you know, that for that, for me, that was one of the things I learned when I was going through the recovery program at the Nehemiah house, we'd go out and go hiking or we'd go do this or do that. They're like, and I realized that like, hold on, like I can do these things and have fun and enjoy life and there not be a substance involved in them. And there actually be some real depth and, you know, yeah. some real quality to the relationships that are being formed in those processes. And so I think that I mean, that's awesome that, you know, that got that event coming up and, you know, you're planning and coordinating. Once again, I know it'll be a, I know it'll be a great thing. Um, and just to get a group of people together, man, it's, it's so important, especially nowadays. Yeah, hang on one second, Kyle, and I want to talk just about that. I'm getting the pictures. I want to show you, boys. Uh, Ricky Tatum, I know you're watching. Don't go nowhere, son. Don't go nowhere. 
I'm Looks gonna like go. He's, he's ready. He's ready. I know he said he says he's ready. Let me let me let me pull some stuff up for you guys real quick. Uh, I want you to see it. Uh, I want you to be it. That was my wife who just gave me that idea. I mean, if nothing else, coming out there and dunking you, I mean, that's worked it. Uh, that's I'm fixing, worked it. You know, I'm fixing to do something that I'm probably going to regret, and I'm going to do it in front of 28 live viewers. Uh, I'm, I'm nervous about even saying it, and it's your fault, Kyle. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so first things first, here's the flags, Ricky Tatum, for the capture of the flag. Uh, my boy Alex and Sean. Sean will be graduating that day, and he is the valedictorian. Okay, so you guys see the capture of the flag, right? Okay, here's the flyer, one of the flyers for the event. Yeah. Did you make that? No, I had it made. So All it's right. Saturday, yeah, August 15th. It's 10 bucks for adults, $5 for kids. There is a complete water park, right? Like full water park there. There's 23 different docks. Uh, you know, there's kayak races, capture the flag. And here's our agenda. This is something I really want to show you guys. And so the gates open at 1030. The band starts at 1130. I'm going to be speaking from 12 to 1220, uh, which normally I don't speak at my own events, but I, I had a lot of encouragement to hype everybody up. And so yeah, that's yeah. what I'm going to do. Uh, then we're going to have a balloon release for those who died in active addiction and who never made it to recovery. And so you can take a marker and you can write your loved ones names uh, like Tanner Harvey, Clint, uh, Conley, you know, you can like write their names on the balloons and then we're going to count down and release them. Uh, we got water balloon war during capture the flag. If you get hit with a water balloon or tagged, you go to jail. You can't get out of jail till your teammates find you and tag you. You know, uh, the PAC project, the first peer recovery program inside of a jail is graduating that day. And then you've got uh, Tawana Greenlaw, who works with you, Kyle. She's going to be our yeah, three right. o'clock speaker. That's going to be fire. Sheriff Staley. Uh, we're going to have a three-legged race. You know what I mean? Uh, a three-legged race. That's when, you know, me and another person in recovery are going to tie, put one leg each in a potato sack, tie them together, and then race. That's going to be hilarious. I'm going to fall and bust my head. <laughs> you know, uh, the dunk tank, it's just going to be amazing. Uh, we, we expect, we've got about 200 people that have committed to come right now, right? Here's what I'm going to do for you, Kyle. If 500 people show up, <clears throat> 500 people show up, I'm going to blow the dust off of my microphone and Ooh. I'm going to rap one song Ooh. one time. So okay. that gives that leaves me between now and one month to find a song, you know what I mean? To find an instrumental. <laughs> God, man. You got that. Yeah, you I, yeah that. I will. I've got to write and perform a song and get ready uh, to perform it if 500 people show up to the event. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to be safe. We're taking temperatures. We're doing contact screening. So if you got 100.4 or up, you can't come in. Uh, we got to keep it safe. We'll have masks on till you get to the lake. Uh, and then you, you're not required to wear them. Just be safe and, and try to be responsible. You know, we want you to have fun. We want you to enjoy yourself. Uh, you know, and so yeah, that's it, man. Yeah, well, I mean, working. I mean, that's exciting. We got you. We got to. We got to share something and and, and say that <laughs> so everybody knows. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Working at the hospital, man, I, I, the importance of safety and social distancing and wearing masks, man, I, I, I don't know if I would have ever realized it before working at the hospital, man. This stuff is real. You know, it's it's very serious. And uh, so, yeah, definitely commend you and the and the organizers for making sure that's, uh, that's you know, highlighted and that's, uh, you know, all the proper precautions are taking place because we, 
man, we all got to do our part in trying to keep everybody and ourselves healthy and safe uh, while we're going through these unprecedented times. Right. Uh, hang on a second, Kyle. I'm looking. Hey, Bonnie wanted us to uh, – she asked, well, what does this money support? I figured the uh, – We can't get into all that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie, but it can't conflict with this job. <laughs> I have no sense. Yeah, good stuff. I can tell you this. It goes to people in recovery housing. That much I can tell you. Uh, I was looking for something. Oh, well. I was going to pull up a, a little song so they could have a taste of it, but not going to get into it. <laughs> that intro, that drop it in the box, drop it in the drop box. Drop it in the box. Yeah, we'll bust a little flow. I can, you know, 500 people show up, dog. I ain't got no choice. I'm going to get up there and I'm going to let it rip. Bro, I've got I've got you on my Apple Music. No, you do. Yeah, you let me music. what are you looking for? Yeah. Pleasure and pain. J Bo, <laughs> there you are right there. Oh man. Let me hear it. What song is it? I got the whole album, man. No, play the whole album. I wouldn't play the whole album. But there's a bunch yeah, of cuts in that album. The pleasure and pain one is the one that I wrote that in recovery. I was in that one's clean. You can play it. You can play the first part of it. Let me hear it. Hey. You're going to make Ricky Tatum jealous. Hey. <laughs> if it wasn't for lost, would it be in the game? I can't lie, see, I've been going through a thing. Lately, I've been praying for change. Hey, yeah, I remember that. I did that. <laughs> yeah, man, you, you did that at, uh, oh, what were we doing at Wolf Street? The, the peer party? Yeah, but I didn't want to do it. I got tricked into it. You so. got tricked to do it, but you did it that night, and I was like, oh, I got to find that. You yeah. can find it on local music. Someone asked, just type in J-Bo. You can find him. And and that, like you said, some songs, <laughs> so you can tell we're not in recovery. <laughs> so be prepared to meet J-Bo uh, for sure. Yeah. But you're talented, man. You're talented. So hopefully get those 500 people. Chelsea's in the background. She said, I did not want them to look that up. <laughs> you know, we're considering paying somebody to clean up the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, that's the thing about the internet. We put something out there. It, it don't go away easy. Okay, Ricky Tatum said, yeah, you know what? Me and Ricky Tatum need to write old gospel recovery rap or something, man. There we'll go. together. At the thing, if 500 people show up. <laughs> hey, listen, it's been a great show. Uh, I got to say, if you need help or treatment, inbox us at the recovery clinic. We will do everything we can uh, to place you in contact with a peer specialist. We will also try to help you get treatment, housing, whatever you guys need. Uh, you know, just know that we love you. We care. Um, we started the recovery clinic because we know the impact that COVID-19 is putting on people in recovery. You know, the overdose rates have spiked. Suicide rates have spiked. Uh, you know, we need each other right now more than anything, which is why we're having that event on August 15th. You know, uh, Kyle, I love you, dude. You're amazing to me. Ne guess who next week's guest is? Oh, who is it? Ryan Hampton. Ooh, nice. Hey National yeah. Advocates. Uh, Works for Voices of, of Recovery, you know, Faces of Addiction. He's a best-selling author called American Fix. Uh, you know, Ryan fights for people in recovery. You can often see him on CNN News. And what he's going to do is tell us how small-town people in Arkansas who are in recovery can fight to to help make big changes for, for our nation. So, That's hey, awesome, let's love you guys, and we will see you next Wednesday at 11. Kyle, stay on here for a minute. All right, man.